Our next presentation introduces another gifted talent, William Gill. When most photographers are retiring for the night, William is ramping up his evening in preparation for his passion, railroad photography at night. During the day, William works as the director of web design for the University of Albany and photographs railroad scenes at night. His undergraduate degree in information technology and art provided the technical foundation for building and lighting his outdoor studios along the tracks. Today's presentation will not only feature William's stunning finished products, but also give us an inside look at the extraordinary process he has developed to achieve his nocturnal imagery, including his experimentation with tools, stands, wiring, and unique power sources coupled with his Herculean patience. William lives with his wife, Stephanie, and their dog, Woodrow, in a row house they recently restored a few blocks from the tracks in Troy, New York. Please join me in welcoming William Gill. Thank you so much. Let me. Share keynote here. Seeing uh, some good stuff there, Todd. Looks good, Will. Yeah, just uh, probably hit play right. to get the to get the screen full size. Oh yeah, that's what go. I've done here. Okay, okay no, it, it it's perfect now. Excellent. All right. Well, it's uh, thank you, Todd, and it's really an honor to be here today. Uh, you know, with an organization um, comprised of so many people who are interested in representing the natural environment and the built environment, and sort of the intersection of those two, um, and also an organization that is working to preserve the work of Jim Shaughnessy. Um, he inspired me to go out and explore the railroad landscape in the first place, and then. Uh, his work, uh, when uh, his night work became available uh, to me, inspired me to go out and photograph at night. So I went to RPI in Troy, New York. I had the uh, odd fortune to work at the Model Railroad Club there. That was my work study. I, I can't imagine something for many of the people here that would be more lucky than that. So it was wonderful. And much of that model railroad is built around and uh, is a model representation of his photography. So he had dropped off tons of just very quickly made prints, not, not the nice ones you see um, in books, but he would just, you know, knock things out in his dark room as reference images. And students would then recreate these scenes as, H, uh, as HO models. So I went out many times to these places to photograph myself and not really with the intention of photographing trains, uh, but from a country standpoint um, and to have a, you know, a, a model building reference. Um, so uh, the, my lead in picture here was a state line tunnel. The picture uh, from Shaughnessy is taken from within state line tunnel. And this is uh, the, RPI Model Railroad Club's representation of it uh, in uh, scale and done in plaster. Uh, so, after college, I went out and photographed almost exclusively at night. And I started using both film and digital and working with ambient light seen here. And then I got a few electronic flashes and uh, would walk around <laughs> as the human light stand and light up things. I, what brought me out into the city at night was really Brassai's work uh, in the 1930s uh, in Paris. So I spent a lot of time at bars. I spent a lot of time at art parties. This is uh, taken in this enormous gas holder building right around the corner from where I live. Here we go. All right. 
And I also spent a lot of time at undergrad um, underground concerts and. I didn't really think that. Pay off for railroad photography only being in crowded and chaotic and dirty places actually turned out to be perfect for lighting trains at night, especially um, dealing with the people you run into. The railroad landscapes are very different from the party scene, but either way, you're going to meet a lot of drunk people. It's a good experience. So right around the time that I was getting bored with the party scene, which is a thing that happens to people, um, Shaughnessy's The Call of Trains came out. And I bought it because he was from Troy, and I had sort of forgotten about all the prints that he had dropped off at RPI because they were his name wasn't on them. They were just unlabeled prints uh, that would just lay around the floor. So when I saw this picture here um, of a train sitting high up on a bridge uh, in right at the border of Vermont and, and New York, I said, well, I want to do this too, and I want to do this now. Um, I didn't quite understand that he had posed the train, but you know, parked it and then painted with flash bulbs, but not knowing that detail was actually perfect. Uh, sort of to give me the, the, uh, the, the ignorance and hubris to go out and try and take pictures of moving trains. And I, I loved the concept that you could use lights to control how a scene worked, much like a model builder would control how, um, you know, how you would build up a scene. So, to photograph moving trains at nights, I use uh, I, I use strobes. Uh, I use speed lights, which are the lights that go on top of a hot shoe on a camera. You see press people carrying these around. I use those, and I also use really big studio uh, strobes or mono blocks. Sometimes they're called, which is what's shown here. These are really big uh, flashes, and um, you usually see those in a photo studio. I, I've got mine hooked up on batteries so I can take them outside. And what happens here is they all fire at the same time for an instant when the camera fires, triggers. Um, and there's a couple ways to make this occur because if you think about uh, taking pictures of a moving train, uh, you don't want a lot, you know, motion blur. So they have to be synchronized pretty quickly. Uh, Winston Link, uh, 65 years ago, used flash bulbs, and he hardwired everything together. Um, sort of being a cheapskate, I thought, well, maybe I'll use wires because other options look expensive. And then I thought about how much all that copper wire would cost, and I quickly realized I need something else. Uh, for a while, I was using optical slaves, uh, which are often built into the small lights. When one flash goes, and others see it, they all trigger at the same time. Uh, the advantage of these is they're cheap. Uh, it's a very, very fast way to trigger lights, uh, which is good. The downside is everything sort of has to be within line of sight and relatively close. So what I use now are radio, um, radio triggers. They uh, work over a pretty long distance. They, oops. They um, uh, they work over about fifteen hundred feet, and if I'm careful, I can stretch them even further. Sorry, everyone. I guess I had a cursor in the middle of the screen there. <laughs> All right. So. The reason I, I set this all up at night is because I get to set up, start with a completely blank canvas, just darkness out there. And then I get to build up the light that I want where I want it. Um, to me, the night is dramatic. It's not really a creepy landscape. Sometimes people think I might be going for creepy. I, I, I like drama, but not really creepiness. Um, and as Todd mentioned in my introduction, I have a day job, so I really can't go out and take pictures uh, during the day. So what I want to do here real quick is walk you through um, 
how my lighting has changed over the last couple of years and then get into why it's changed. So uh, I think I have four images here made at the arches in Chester, Massachusetts. There's a stretch there where there's a bunch of stone arch bridges from the 1840s. They're really awesome. And as it turns out, a little bit challenging. So I made this picture about seven or eight years ago. And uh, I did the thing that everybody does when they try to take a picture at night. And I put all the lights on the side of the camera and lit it up. And um, it looks kind of, I, I don't know what it looks like, but it doesn't look like nighttime. I started, you know, really uh, trying to control the details by adjusting the angle of light on various uh, surfaces. So I started trying to uh, bring out the rockiness of the, the bridge by bringing the lights off to the side to give it some contrast. Um, if you look just to the left of the two arches, you can see this white line that's actually a tall light stand i'm trying to get the lights out of the way um so that's what's going on here about three or four years ago i shot again at the same place and i got in here i added the human it's me to the scene to add some scale and i also added some theatrical fog uh to the scene to to really control the atmospheric effects and i've added a couple lights behind the bridge um you can see on the under the right the, the rightmost arch there there's light back there and um, that's something i continue doing so this is the last in the series of, of, of four images i did this in 2019 uh there's still a person in it still me uh Instead of raising up the lights, I've raised up the camera on this one, and that's really accentuated the scale effect of the small human at the bottom and a big train on top, and I like that. Um, and all of the lights are now behind the bridge. So we get this extreme silhouetting going on here. Um, Gregory Crutzen, who has been a huge influence into how I shoot, shot here. Um, I, I didn't know about his work until I shot at the arches and somebody passing by said, some other lunatic was here with a bunch of lights, Gregory, somebody. So after a bunch of Googling, I found him and, and his um, work really opened up new possibilities for respecting the look of night. Now, I, I'm trying to tell different stories, different narratives than he focuses on, but I think um, concentrating on a narrative at all and respecting the look of night, I've learned a lot from uh, looking at his work. This image is made about a quarter mile from the previous one. And I work in this area of Massachusetts frequently, uh, partly because it has very dramatic scenery, I like that, partly because it's remote and that allows me to really spread out and not bother neighbors, which is wonderful. There's a lot of room to work here. And partly because um, as a kid, I remember being in my parents' car, following the railroad uh, along Route 20, and matching speeds with this Conrail auto rack train, uh, and you know the sides of it just coming in and out of the light as we go up and down and around it, and, and, and drifting apart and coming back together. And it was this really amazing um, experience where you, you wouldn't usually call an experience intimate with trains, <laughs> but it was an intimate night experience with a train where uh, we, we were just moving together uh, in the night. So for me, uh, watching a train pass at night, and I'm sure many people up here have watched one pass at night, is really mostly the anticipation of waiting for it to come. Um, at night, it's really quiet. You can hear a train miles off in the distance. And as you sit there waiting for the train to come, even when it's dark, details start to reveal themselves in the whatever pools of ambient light are there. 
And when the train arrives, it just becomes the singular focus. It's loud. Um, it has its own lights on it. So you're sort of drawn to that. And maybe there's exhaust reaching up into the sky. Um, you know, as you stand there or sit there, the, the ground shakes. Uh, it's all encompassing. And then after we get used to that cacophony, it's gone. And it's perfectly quiet again. And suddenly you, you realize there's, there's crickets or cicadas. So I was asked to talk today a bit about my process of creating images at night. And I, I really don't want to do sort of a tutorial because uh, there's a million other better places to get that and it, you, it would probably be boring. But instead, I want to talk about how I approach the night landscape and how I work with it. So this is a picture of a coaling tower in Oakland, Pennsylvania. And it really, uh, I think, reflects the kinds of places I like to work. We have a good location. There's this dramatic S curve. Uh, I like that. Uh, it passes underneath this um, this coaling tower, which is really an artifact of railroading's past. They built these railroads built these really big, heavy, expensive to demolish things, and they just sit out there. Uh, so it tells a story about um, the industry. From the practical perspective, there's some really good things about this place. There's a lot of room to work. Uh, there's trees growing up in the post industrial landscape already, but there's still a lot of work, uh, a lot of room rather to work around in the, in the, in the shrubbery in the, in the cinders on the side. So that that's good. Um, as. As the train sort of snakes around in this space, there's room to put lights where the lights won't immediately spill onto a wall of trees behind it. Um, so that makes it a good space. And to make the whole scene work, this is shot at 105 millimeters, which is sort of a classic focal length for 35 millimeter uh, cameras, but it also allows to compress the whole scene up. At night, a lot of people go with wide angle lenses, but I can't say enough about going with a telephoto. What that means though, is that this is an enormous scene. It's a thousand feet to the Coaling tower, and it's another thousand feet to where the those tank cars are uh, behind the locomotive. So, in setting out the lights, uh, that's a two thousand foot walk to put down that light in the back, and it's a two thousand foot walk back. So let's say we mess around a little bit. That's a mile right there, and that's one light. And I usually carry between five and eight. So I do a lot of walking. I think if there's anything I'm better at than any other photographers, it's walking. It's really all I do. Oops. There we go. Um, so working at long distance, distances, uh, distances like I just described, uh, requires some radio repeaters. So the 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 electronic releases I was talking about, the the radio triggers I was talking about, the ones I use have um, a radio repeater function that's awesome when i took this picture back in 2012 i thought i was uh, an absolute genius i had invented radio repeaters the model then didn't have that function so i bought two and i plugged one into the other and i put them on different channels and that allowed me to tuck lights off uh to either side of main street here and light up the train uh as it passed through previous to this i, I couldn't get lights that far out of line of sight off to the sides and and in doing so, uh, really allowed me to start hiding lights in different places, hide them beside, you know, behind the trains, off to the sides, uh, and it really opened up just a ton of freedom uh, for lighting design. So that last picture was 2012. I think this is 2019 or 20, and now all the lights are behind the train. Um, and really learning how to exploit the radios was key to get there. There is a radio tower, uh, a portable mast that I carry with me behind this train. And it's about 1500 feet from the camera to that tower. And it's relaying the signal to a string of five lights that are hidden behind the train. And at 1500 feet, that's about as far as we're gonna get with a radio anyway. 
and then trying to get the signal through the steel cars wouldn't happen. So being able to lift that radio up above the uh, the train, get a clear line of sight to it, was key to making this work. Um, I'll also point out that um, often I like to work in marshes. That's a environment I can work in okay. But here it's frozen. So there's, there was no other way to get you know any signal, any helpers to my signal out rather than putting something behind the train because no one's going to go out to a frozen marsh. So here's a picture of these telescopic masts. Here it is lifted up above a chain link fence with a light on it. They are great problem solvers. I can use them to get my camera above things to change the perspective or lights around obstacles. Uh, chain link fences are a common thing. Reach right over them. I can also use them to put lights in water, which is how I get away with a lot of my shots. Um, I paddle out. I until you know I, I extend these masts. They can go up to fifty feet. Uh, they have a big aluminum tripod base in them, and I set them all up and I throw the whole thing overboard. I find a flat spot and I, I, I leave them out there, uh, and they're very happy to spend all night just out in the drink. Um, my first thought uh, to take uh, to set this up was to use floating lights, but in many of these places, you know, it's tidal, and the lights would just spin around on on, a, on an anchor as the tide goes in or out, and you know, they, it would be impossible to keep them focused. So I developed these tall light stands so I could take this picture, and then I've used them all over the place since. So this is um, at the Valley Railroad in Connecticut, and the big scenic feature of the Valley Rail Railroad is the Connecticut River, uh, but it's really hard to include it in your shots if it's in the background. So by working from the riverside, I was able to make it a foreground element. Uh, this required that I put lights out in the river and uh, staging my poor father here <laughs> in a, an aluminum rowboat on a very cold night, but he was recreating um, uh, an experience I saw with duck hunters going by in a little in a little boat like this. So when I started with the tall poles, their use was lights. But in the last couple of years, cameras have started including uh, Wi-Fi connections, so you can preview and take pictures and review pictures from your cell phone remote from the camera. So when that happened, it allowed me to start putting my camera up on a pole, and that's what we got here is a camera about up about, I don't know, 20 feet up. Um, and it just hangs out there all night, relaying its image back down to the, to the operator. Oops, there we go, there we go. So by being able to lift up the camera, it allows me to shoot in places like this where um, it just wouldn't be feasible to shoot from the ground. I tried many times, but the bottom of the train gets cut off, uh, no good. And then I've been able to combine lights on poles in the water and lights elevated uh, while working in marshes uh, like this. I first saw this scene in Hudson, New York from an Amtrak train and uh, you know, immediately fell in love with it. This is the Fogarty Boat Club. It was a bunch of, of fishing shacks built up on um, uh, dredging spoils. So it's kind of a no man's land out there. So they built all these shacks. Uh, they were destroyed in um, Hurricane Sandy and they've just been sitting out there. Uh, my plan was to get out very quickly and shoot here, but it took a year to figure out how to actually do it. And thankfully they didn't demolish them. So my first thought was, well, I could just go out over the marsh when it was frozen. However, I, I tried that and, and I got my feet very wet and I, uh, it didn't work. So frozen marshes, no good. So I determined I could not move a camera and lights through the marsh. There we go. So 
I came back uh, and tried from the Riverside. This is my wife, Stephanie, who uh, often helps out uh, visiting sites with me. And we paddled in from the Riverside and went hunting for a good place of, uh, to, to put the camera where we could show the shacks and the, um, the train. And we thought, well, we could put the camera behind the shacks in the marsh, come in from canoe, and that'll be great. So finding in this place turned out to be really difficult. Here's the view working in the marsh. Uh, you can walk around and I'm about six foot three and <laughs> this is my literal view in the marsh. You can't see anything. So having that elevated pole turned out to be key. I, I put my camera on the pole and would put it up like a periscope, look around and I finally found a place. So on the night that I went to shoot here, I loaded up all the gear, set up the camera uh, on a tall pole. And if you look, not sure if you'll be able to see on your screens uh, at home, but to the left of the more left uh, uh, shack is a tree. And in the middle of it is a, you can see a very straight pole. That's the camera out there. Um, so I set it up and then I went around uh, making some exposures, uh, trying to figure out where to put the lights. So this is just me going out, um, making some test exposures so I can find places for lights. So as the um, complexity of these images has grown, the amount of time I spend outside has really increased as well. And I never really went camping as a kid. And at some point I realized I was camping now, so I might as well embrace it. I, I made this image um, up on the Delaware and Hudson at Red Rocks. Um, it's this huge cliff along uh, Lake Champlain. And I thought, well, I'll include the, the tent I'm using now. Um, so to make this image, I ended up sailing to this location um, and I set up the tent and spent the night and waited for the train. And I wouldn't usually use a sailboat to get somewhere. That's a little silly, but its mast provided a light stand so that you can see there's a, a light mounted on the top of that um, boat there. And it's just sitting out there. And um, after being a photo prop, I just slept in the tent. And the camera is out on a tripod on this sand spit, uh, which is usually pretty deep, but in late September, the water has gotten to its lowest point. So I was able to stand out there and most of my night is trying to keep warm, uh, which I lit a fire here because I was soaking wet, but usually I just sit out there and listen to the radio. And this camping method works really great um, when it's uh, warm out and the railroad is busy at night. So um, one of the things I can do is I can hike out to a location. I can meet the neighbors who are, are usually pretty cool. I can set up a camp. I can then set out my lights. and then wait hours for a train to come. And this is up on the Boston and Albany and um, the trains never come. So you end up just falling asleep. And I've started using my radio scanner as my alarm clock. So I just leave it on, <laughs> go to bed. And when it starts making noise, I know it's time to wake up and take my picture. Um, that method of photography works pretty good in remote locations where it's warm, no one will bother the lights. Um, but if it's cold, you really can't leave lights out. Uh, the battery is running for hours and hours without any uh, support. So this image here is um, the Bear Mountain Bridge on the Hudson River. Uh, I saw this scene from an Amtrak train on the other side, the other bank, and thought I wanted to shoot here. Um, but I took this in the winter and it was just impossible to leave the batteries running for, for six or eight hours waiting for a train. So the way that this image worked is I developed jackets, insulated jackets for uh, my battery. So here's one of my uh, battery inverters that powers the lights. 
they're just an off the shelf thing. And then I just built these little sleeves with a reflectix, which is like this alumalized bu bubble wrap. I put some Dacron on, on there for an outside sleeve. And there was my, um, you know, my insulator. And the inverters are constantly generating a little bit of weight so they keep themselves warm. Putting batteries in a insulator on their own wouldn't really help in heat. So the rest of the gear, my uh, camera is pretty happy in the snow. I use the sunshade as a snow shade. Um, everything goes in Pelican cases, which um, even when they get soaking wet and freeze, seem pretty happy. Uh, I, on the other hand, hand, I'm very unhappy in the cold. So I uh, made myself an insulated quilt um, so I can snowshoe out to locations and just sit there and look really, really grumpy in the snow. Um, so that's one way I do sort of businesses is set up and sit out there for hours. What I've recently started to try to do is, um, increase my efficiency a little bit and work faster. So this picture is a little tricky. It's a telephoto picture taken about 200 millimeters looking right down a track. And I wanted to take the picture right as the train. Um, exited the tangent part of track and entered the curve. And it's really easy to find the tangent point when you're off, like where I am in the, uh, with the camera here, looking down the straight section of the track, that's easy. But when you actually try to walk to that point so you can set up the lights, it's impossible because you can't tell if you're on a curve or on straight, you know, it's really hard. Um, and I needed to find this, this spot so I could stand there to trigger the camera remotely. Uh, in the day, you can see a train coming at night, or in, you know, coming at you. That works fine. But at night, it just looks like a giant orange ball. So you can't look through the camera to take the picture. So I need to stand out where I want to take the picture. And when the train goes by, use the remote to, to shoot it. So to speed things up, what I've started using is Google Maps. So let me tell you what we got going on here. Off on the left-hand side, we've got a blue pin. Um, on a black line, that's my camera location, uh, safely off in a state preserve off to the side of the tracks there. Um, the blue circle is me walking around with a cell phone so I can see where I am on the map. This is a screenshot from my phone. Um, there's a blue dot right about in the middle of this line. That's where I wanted to take the picture of the train and the orange, uh, uh spots are where I wanted to put my lights. So, literally, I made this plan, dropped the camera down, walked around using my phone, and I set up that whole scene we just looked at um, completely fly by wire on, on GPS on the phone. So, there's me standing out there right where the, the tangent meets the curve, waiting for the train to go by, standing with my remote. And of course, when I took the picture of the train, a good couple steps back. Easy shot. It also, that method of making a map first is key when doing a much more complex shot. So here, there's a ton going on here, but it'll make sense in just a second. On the right-hand side is a blue pin um, off in the trees. That's the camera location for this shot. There's a couple little blue sections of, of uh, line. That's the uh, where the train's gonna be. Uh, blue pins are radio repeaters to get the signal all the way into the back. And then there's some orange pins. That's the lights. Um, and, and they have, um, orange lines coming at them out of them. That's where the lights will be pointed. I'm trying to generate glare here. So I need the lights to reflect off the surface of the train and bounce towards the camera. So I just sort of figure that out ahead of time. This was about a 6 mile hike to set up and a 6 mile hike to tear down. I just couldn't afford to get it wrong. So I made a couple trips, made a map, and then just set the whole thing up according to a plan. And it more or less worked. So I was pretty happy with it. Um, this is in Zor, Massachusetts. It's right outside the Hoosick Tunnel. Um, I'm up on this high vantage point. Once I set up the lights, there was just no going back down there to mess with them. So I, I, I measured everything, set it up, and, and hoped. Um, this has the look of mountain railroading. It looks really mountainous there, although we're really only a couple hundred feet above sea level. So it's, it's kind of a funny spot. 
but um, by incorporating that uh, um, line of the hills, the, the, the silhouette above it, it really starts giving a, a night effect. I ran that whole same plan of making a map after visiting, um, including the hills um, and using glare lighting on the side of a train for this. This is again, um, this is on the Boston and Albany, uh, right near the arch bridges. And it's really easy to try and set up in the mountains at night. And if you're close to the train, you can't tell you're in the mountains. And if you back away too far, it's really, really easy for it to just look um, detailless. So I've been really working hard to sort of uh, establish a, a grammar, a visual grammar of what mountains look like and then capture that. So uh, curves of track, mountainous profiles, I've been going after that. I must confess that for 2020, I did not plan to be taking pictures of mountains. What I had planned to do was take pictures of models, uh, human models, uh, posed pictures by the track with actors. So COVID-19 had other plans. It really wasn't safe to work with uh, actors and crews, but that's where I wanted to be. Um, when I'm setting up and shooting on the side of the tracks, often people stop by and tell me stories about how they hop trains or rode a motorcycle through a tunnel or um you know ran up ran down the bridge as the train arrived all, all these kind of classic stories and i wanted to start representing those stories uh rebuilding them on my own using things i could so this is a picture about people just uh with nothing you know teenagers with nothing to do but drive around and they, they've taken a moment to watch the train go by. Um, and as I build up these images, I, I pull a lot from stories that people tell me, but also other artists uh, like Pat Perry or Swampy, uh, who uh, are graffiti artists who also hop trains. Um, and um, yeah. I find that when I'm out, at night, or maybe I pass by somebody at night, you, know, you see just a, a, a glimpse just for a second of, of there's a story unfolding, but we only get a, a, a split second of it. So that's what I try and do um, when I'm posing these images. You know, you, you, you've showed up and something's happening, but it, it's not quite clear what's going on. And while I would like to get away from it, I'm often stuck being my own model. So I get to pretend like I'm a crew member on a railroad. Um, it's an opportunity for me to tell a story that's not my own, not my own personal story. Uh, what if I was a crew member? What would that be like? And what would it be like to be working, kicking grain cars around in the middle of a snowstorm? Or what if I hop freight trains? How would that be? Um, in sort of true cinematic uh, style, the camera's actually way outside the other side of this boxcar with a telephoto lens to compress the inside of the boxcar um, uh, right up against the passing uh, train on a, on, on a track out front, uh, make it feel much closer than it really is. And this is one of the few pictures I've taken with continuous lighting to get the motion blur. Ultimately, I really like working with other actors uh, to capture these pictures. And I, I like to pose this question, you know, what would it be like to hide just outside the lights in the yard and wait for your train to get going? And I think maybe many of us haven't hopped trains, but maybe we've snuck out to go swimming at night. Um, so we could imagine what that might be like. And if you haven't, you could uh, put on REM's Night Swimming, uh, which is deeply nostalgic in its, in its way, but a little less um, perhaps than so many railroad photo shoots. 
So uh, I think that's that's where I like to be uh, Americana, but not entirely saccharine. All right. So my go my goal for 2020 was to be shooting scenes like this. I could not, but I want to take a little look into what 2020 opened up instead. I think when we think back to 2020, uh, it was a very strange year, and uh, we think about COVID-19. Many people in the East will also note that it was a year that part of the Hoosick Tunnel collapsed, which uh, ruined a bunch of shots I had planned, but it opened something up. A whole ton of freight trains got detoured through Vermont. And I mentioned that uh, it was Jim Shaughnessy's uh, night photography that got me out at night working. Um, now trains were going right through the places, I think, uh, where he did his best work. Um, and in fact, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this that uh, it was his image of a, of a train at night posed up on a bridge. Well, this is that same bridge. I've been waiting for eight years for a train to show up at night on it, and here we go. So I was able to get out in 2020 and shoot in Vermont. This is the town of Chester, Vermont. And it could entirely be a, um, a museum, really the whole town. Uh, spinning 360 around is a church, um, a couple houses, a deli, and they all look just like this little view here. Um, this was shot right on the edge of mud season in Vermont. Uh, the snow's melting. Uh, when the rain stopped, it left all this atmosphere in the air, and it's and it's and it's and it's here. Um, and you know, we have a train working down between a uh, preserved depot and a sort of accidentally preser preserved but abandoned uh, or unused uh, hardware store. The, this is Arlington. Um, Vermont. And um, it has been preserved as a family home. And the pandemic really, really helped here. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, homes clustered around it. And instead of being a pest, it was sort of a novelty that I showed up during the pandemic uh, to set up. There's lights everywhere in this scene. There, there's one right behind the locomotive to light up the exhaust. There's another one uh, around the bend to light up the inside, and there's a bunch around the depot. And uh, it was one of those shots I never would have been so bold to, to do, only over time, everyone liked it. All right. Two more pictures here, and then we'll be all set. Um, Hurricane Irene washed away this bridge in Bartonsville, and I think uh, people who have noticed Shaughnessy's work in uh, Vermont will recognize it. Uh, he shot here a few times, and perhaps his best known image that I'll leave us with here today is at Cuttingsville. He posed some RS3s, a bunch of boxcars, pictures taken here showing up on the cover of his books, um, it's an iconic Vermont spot, and we really lucked in to be able to shoot here when everything got detoured. Um, and it's a rare opportunity that I think 2020 opened up. Um, so I was glad to be there. And that's what I got. I'm William Gill. I take pictures of trains at night, and I walk a lot. William, that was fantastic. Wonderful. Wonderful work and, and great to have that behind the scenes uh, look into some of these, these spectacular night shots. I know you have a lot and I'm really impressed with your innovation on solving some of these technical challenges. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any new technical challenges that you're working on right now that you could you could give us a little bit of uh, insights to what we might expect from you next. Um, I've, I think long, longer distances of the radios. Uh, device subjects. It, I think the longer distance of the radios is something I'm working on the most. I keep stretching that out and I'm trying, I have some shots I want to shoot over the Hudson River. Um, and it's sort of miles of open territory. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'm sure you'll figure out a way and I'm, I'm sure we'll look forward to seeing it.
We have a, a couple, and I know we need to get into our next presentation, but we have a couple of questions about uh, equipment and techniques. I know one person asked about the different types of, of tripods and stands that you're using, and, and someone else asked about the best way to, uh, to focus at night. Oh, yeah. So the uh, tall light stands are ham radio um, portable masts. Um, that's what community they come out of. Um, so there's a bunch of different options, but even painter push poles can work. There's a lot of stuff uh, in that space, but those are ham radio um, gear that I've just appropriated. Focusing at night is um, an absolute bear. Uh, the best way is to do it before it's night. <laughs> you can see what you're doing. Um, the other way that I do it is I take an LED light and throw it down where I want the train to be, go back, get it really right, and then remove the light. Haley, any questions coming in on your end? We can maybe do one or two more. Yeah, I'm I'm curious, how long does it take you to plan a shot? And then how long does it take you to stage it? And then do you do that all for just one picture a night? Yeah, generally one picture a night. Um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes I drive up and I'm like, we're gonna take a picture here and it's gonna happen. Um, and then I just work with it until it works. But other times on the more complicated shots, I might visit two or three times ahead of time uh, to do it. it you know, a simple shot maybe takes an hour to set up a complicated one, two or three. Um, in New England, we don't get a lot of trains, so I might wait, an e you know, a couple hours for a train to show up. So it, that's, um, it's a lot of time for one picture. Yes. We have a, a few questions about just how the, the, the train crews react to the, to the uh, bright flash of light in the middle of the night. Oh yeah, that's a, that, that's I think the, usually the first thing that anybody asks. Um, when I started, I made a lot of people uh, plenty angry by not being respectful in the space, and luckily I got a lot of um, constructive and not constructive feedback. But either way, I learned a lot from it, and I work really, really hard not to surprise people. I mean, it's not dangerous quantities of light. You can't literally blind somebody. They're meant for humans, but it's really surprising, and you shouldn't just show up on a dark night. And pop flashes at people without them knowing. So sometimes uh, they know I'm going to be there ahead of time. I talk to people a lot. Um, other times uh, I s you know, make sure that I'm not getting them right into the way you'd be looking from the cab and pop off some lights so they know what's coming. Yeah, don't make people angry. <laughs> Well, do you have a, a website or any place where, uh, or even do you want one person's wondering if you sell prints? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I do sell prints, um, and I uh, sometimes put on Instagram when I'm doing that. But I have a website where all this is. It's trainsatnight.com, which is super easy. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll stick that into the chat right now. Yeah, um, and there's links there to my Instagram and everything. So if people are looking to connect or ask questions, happy to, happy to talk about you know any any super. more narrow technical things. <laughs> 